Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and wait a minute here, and I'll go ahead and let everybody in. There we go. Well, good morning on this rainy Thursday morning, or at least it is here in Spring Hill. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with Hernando County Extension Service, and welcome to our virtual plant clinic today. We have dogs in the background, and just got a question about a mango tree. And we're going to talk a little bit about new types of turf grass here today. And I'd like to introduce our special guest star for the day, Dr. Stacy Strickland. Stacy was the county extension director for both Hernando and Sumter counties and left us how long ago was that? It was a couple of years at this point. It's almost yeah, it's four years now, Bill. Wow, time really flies. So he left four years ago to go be the county extension director in Osceola County. So he's still with Extension, and he's here today to talk a little bit about um, some new types of turf grass that he's been working on there in Osceola County that may apply to a lot of people here. Let me go ahead and admit these people. There we go. Um, Actually, Bill, go I'll admit them if you, you just keep talking. Okay, no problem. Um, let me go ahead, and I only had a few things to cover this morning. I really hadn't gotten a lot of questions emailed to me. I did get one just a few minutes ago, so uh, somebody kind of squeezed in right under the um, uh, mark there. Let me go ahead and share my presentation here. Um, oops. Okay, there we go, a couple little quick updates. Just wanted to mention a few things. Here in Hernando County, um, as many of you probably already know, we do have um, volunteers that work at our office. They're called Master Gardeners. And we're gonna have a new Master Gardener class coming up soon. We're in the process of picking dates. Uh, we're gonna start the training um, so that it is all the way done before Thanksgiving. So we're gonna be starting uh, with an orientation probably in August. Like I said, we're still working on the dates right now. And because of all the issues that the entire world has had with COVID-19 and our office being closed, the vast majority of this training class is gonna be done virtually. So our master gardeners for the last several years, we've been having um, their training, part of it in person for hands-on activities, and then part of it online through a Canvas um, learning platform. Um, online training. So this year is going to be even more different. We're going to have even more online teaching and even less in-person hands-on, although we will still have some. There's some things that you just have to do in-person hands-on, like as far as plant propagation goes, looking at insects to get an idea of what they look like and how to identify them. So more information on that is going to be coming up. The best thing to do is just follow us on Facebook. Whenever something comes up, that's where we put it first. And if you're interested in any of the different classes that we're offering right now, because I recognize a number of the names on here today, and many of you um, are kind enough to tune in to a lot of my other online Zoom classes and Facebook Live classes. Our county extension director, Jim Davis, does a lot of classes on natural resources and different wildlife in the area, along with um, classes on how to identify and control household pests. We have a Sea Grant agent, Brittany Hall Sharp, that does a lot of marine biology classes. So the best place to go to find a listing of all the classes we have coming up, just go on Google, go up to the little search bar at the very top, and type in Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com. Go there and you're gonna see a feed uh, that's the most updated listing of all of our upcoming classes. So go ahead and mark that on your computer, follow that. That way you can see what's coming up. You can put it on your calendar. I know that many of my classes, I try to do them on Facebook Live also, and we record them. For example, we're recording today's plant clinic so that we can uh, put it on YouTube or Facebook and then people who aren't able to join us live can still watch it and get the information from it. So in just a second here, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Strickland to talk a little bit about Citra Blue St. Augustine grass. I know a lot of homeowners have St. Augustine lawns. 
A lot of homeowners have problems with their St. Augustine lawns. That's one of the most common questions that we get. I know that people in certain neighborhoods, certain subdivisions have a lot of problems with their lawns. And lawn problems can be really difficult to diagnose. It could be a broken sprinkler head. It could be chinch bugs. It could be a disease. There's a lot of things that could go wrong with your lawn. So Stacy's gonna talk about that. And let me go ahead and close this out and stop screen sharing. Okay, Stacy, if you wanna talk a little bit about uh, Citra Blue, a new variety of St. Augustine. Awesome, are you seeing my, uh, uh, my slide share, Bill? Yeah, I can see it. Awesome. Okay, so um, there we are. Okay, so we're um, we're actually doing a few little turf grass uh, variety trials as well as other turf grass research. We're probably one of the few extension offices within the uh, in the state that actually has our own research farm. We have seventy five acres with all the equipment. So and there's a lot of different things that are happening out at at, at our research and demonstration plot in, in Kenansville. So one of the things that we're doing that there's that interest to homeowners is we're doing turf grass variety and, and uh, disease trials. Um, and we also have the new uh, forage grasses for cows to eat. So we've got some new variety trials of that that are happening um, and so here in Osceola County, it's a lot different. So you're, I'm an ag agent. So why in the world am I playing with grass? Well, a lot of our uh, big ranches here in Osceola County, they also grow sod. Uh, so um, so we, we grow Bahia grass sod, a lot of St. Augustine. Um, cows will eat St. Augustine grass. So we can actually grow the two crops on the same uh, spot of land. Uh, quite easily. So, so that's kind of why we're doing some of this is because our ranchers not only grow cattle, but they also grow turf grass. So, um, so a couple of new turf grasses that I want you to be aware of. One is Citra Blue. Um, Citra Blue is, I am, I am thoroughly impressed by this, by this grass. Um, Dr. Kevin Kenworthy is the breeder that developed this uh, cultivar. It has a blue-green color. Um, we've got shade tolerance uh, associated with this. And when I talk about shade tolerance, this is not um, that we can grow this in complete darkness. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, it will, it will thrive with, with less than eight hours of sunlight. Um, so when I say less than eight hours of sunlight, I'm not talking you know, it gets one hour of sunlight. I'm talking, you know, it, it'll still make it with seven or, or six and a half hours of sunlight. Um, the disease resistance is the thing that I really love about this grass. And we'll actually get more into disease in just a moment, but this is thick as it can be. So it's going to be very competitive against weeds. Um, we're even seeing some, uh, some some drought tolerance that we would not see with Floratam. We're actually going to do a trial this year where we are going to see exactly how much we can stress this particular grass uh, by using um, water exclusion. So we're, we, we're going to build a shelter that, that we can move and every afternoon rain we're going to, uh, to, to cover that grass so it does not get any rainfall and the only rain that we're going to give it is going to be a, a finite amount of irrigation that, that we're going to do just to see exactly how drought tolerant it is. Um, again, the, the one thing that is really going to stand out to you with Citra Blue is it is spongy. So when you walk on it, it, it feels like you are walking on a sponge. Um, you, you see a little bit of a blue color uh, associated with it. Here, this is one of our plots where we have Citra Blue. So you see the, the agent that is standing in the middle of the grass there. His name is Grantley Ricketts. He is our commercial horticulture agent here in Osceola County. And just to give you an idea of the sponginess of this particular grass, 
look at Grantley's feet. Grantley's feet are, you know, he is sinking in this particular turf grass. You'll also notice there are no weeds in this. It, it, is, uh, it is so prolific that, that, and grows so densely that, that, uh, that we're, we don't have a weed issue associated with this, whereas we do with some of our other turf grass plots. This is an aerial view of, uh, of some of our turf grass plots. And you see the weed problems that we have with some, these are all brand new varieties uh, on the right hand side. These are all brand new varieties of turf grass. We have some zoysias, some centipedes, um, and, and some St. Augustines. None of these, the only one that has been released at this point is Citra Blue, which I have the arrow on. Um, and hey, actually, sir. yes. Yeah. I don't want to be rude and interrupt you, but it's still on the um, first slide. You probably oh, no. need to go in okay. and start it from beginning. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I okay. <laughs> well, it would have made a whole lot more sense to everyone if I had, uh, let's see if I can do this. Okay, are you seeing the turf grass plots? Yeah, there you go. I see the um, the squares of turf grass. Okay, okay. Actually, well, okay, let's go back for just a moment because I was clicking through a lot of slides. Um, so Citra Blue, we, we see a picture of it here. It has the blue-green color. Uh, this is the picture of Grantley. Grantley is the agent that is standing in the middle of this uh, Citra Blue uh, plot. And, and actually, if you look at Grantley's feet, you can't see them because the, the turf grass is actually that spongy. So um, it, it, it is going to be a, a devil to mow with a push mower. I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you that. It's going to be a workout. Um, the one thing that, that, that kind of concerns me, and this is anecdotally, but um, the thatch layer, it, it, we're probably going to have a thatch issue uh, with this grass the longer that, that we have it. So we've actually had this particular grass in cultivation now um, at, and in Kenansville for about six years. Um, so we've been observing it and, and we really have not seen any issues. Again, I want you to take a look. You see absolutely no weeds in this um, turf grass. It is that thick. And this is the research plots that we have. All these are different grasses, e each one of these squares. Uh, some have performed a whole lot better than others. The only one that has been released to this date is Citra Blue, which you see the arrow pointing to. Um, there are some others that, that are really showing some good promise. Um, but take a look at the weeds in the plots. We, we really, we, we let them go as, we try to do things to these plots like uh, we, we really don't spray them a lot because we want to see what they're going to do. Uh, in relation to fungus and and re, in relation to insects and and uh, and and weeds, all on their own. So these are fairly natural with with very minimal input. We really don't even fertilize these plots a lot. Uh, we we try to simulate a, uh, a a low input homeowner situation here, um, and they really don't get a lot of irrigation. So um, for the first three years when this was being established we had no irrigation whatsoever out there. So they established without irrigation to this point. So some of these, I would expect that a couple more of these St. Augustines, as you look at this picture, will be released in the future, but I, I cannot say enough good things about um, Citra Blue. Um, anecdotally, one of the issues that we have seen with Citra Blue uh, is, is chinch bugs. So I have seen chinch bug damage on Citra Blue. Um, but again, I can kill chinch bugs. I can't kill take all root rot. So given the choice between the two of those, I would certainly, um, take the, uh, chinch bugs any day of the week. And, and actually it, it as long as we don't really juice it. And, and what I mean by that is as long as we don't fertilize very heavily, it, it, it doesn't make the, the, uh, turf grass very attractive to chinch bugs in the first place. So actually, if you will look just to the bottom of the Citra Blue plot, that was another St. Augustine variety that, that succumbed to uh, take all root rot. And, and of course, you see when, when the grass dies, weeds are going to grow. So in, in a lot of the cases where you're seeing some of these weeds, that is, that is 
fairly unhealthy turf. Um, another, another new variety that we're working with, this is called Pro Vista. Um, it was developed by Scott, so this is not a, a uh, this is not one of our UF released varieties, but this is a Roundup Ready St. Augustine. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it's slower growing than, than, uh, than Citra Blue, but the fact is, actually you can see in this picture, you had weeds, you can spray Roundup over the top of this particular grass and not kill it. So Pro Vista has a place. Again, it is slow growing. Uh, I have actually noticed some leaf spot issues on Pro Vista, um, but the, the thing that really makes it outstanding is even if you have another grass, see, we can, we can treat broadleaf weeds in St. Augustine, but as soon as we have another grass problem in St. Augustine, it becomes a whole lot more problematic and we're not able to do that. So this is one of our sod farms in, in Osceola County that, that is growing this Pro Vista. So one of the things that we did, we, we try to simulate things that homeowners will do uh, that, that are actually detrimental to grass. And in this case, we, we actually tried to poison, we tried to kill the Pro Vista with Roundup. And in this case, we could not even kill the Pro Vista with Roundup. So, so that is great. Um, let you see a few of the take all root rot trials. This is our this is our biggest problem that we have associated with turf grass, in my opinion, is is this root disease. Um, in in this particular trial, we're we're using two Bermudas, which are 419. That's that's your athletic field. So uh, so football fields and soccer fields, they're going to use uh, typically 419. Uh, Celebration is another type of Bermuda. The two St. Augustines that we used were Bitter Blue and Floritam. We used two Bahias, which are Argentine and Pensacola. And we used two Zoysias, which are Empire and Jammer. This is an aerial view of the Take All Root Rot trials. We have it replicated three times. Um, actually, this was a surprise to us because the yellow plots that you see Bahia grass is resistant to take all root rot. But for some reason, take all root rot turned these uh, trials yellow. Now the grass did recover and turn back green, but it was as, as yellow as, as it could possibly be as, uh, as a red light. So, um, but it did recover. Now some of these are not going to recover. This is a, this is a ground view of the same plots. Um, so if we go back to these same plots, the disease never goes away. And so these are uh, just a little about the, the trials themselves. Um, some of these respond a whole lot better than others. Um, this is our progression over 23 weeks. We see recovery from our uh, Bahia grass in our Pensacola and Argentine. So all of a sudden it looks like the disease is going to get our uh, Bahia grass, but our Bahia grass bounces back. So that's, that's great news. Um, we saw a similar type bump with, uh, with Bermuda grass. So our Bermuda grass actually got really diseased. It got really thin and then it, it, uh, it, it's, it, it too recovered but not at the same level. So again, we, we still got that, that disease that is working on this. And, and that's the, the thing about take all root rot is it never goes away. Um, so eventually it will claim our Bermuda grass, our Bahia grass, I'm sorry, not our Bahia grass, our Bermuda grass, our Zoysia, and our St. Augustine. You, as a homeowner, what you're going to see is every year our, our grass gets thinner and thinner, kind of like our hair. So, so when, when that happens, eventually that, that, uh, that grass will start kind of dying off. And the first indication that you may have that, that you've got a take all root rot problem is you just have a yard full of weeds. And, and again, when, when we have bare soil in Florida, it is not going to stay just bare dirt for very long. We're growing, going to grow something in that, whether it's a whether it's the, the sod that we want or a weed. 
so another thing that we're actually doing, we're doing some soil moisture sensors um, and we're doing research out at H and H side, which is uh, one of our side places. Here you see uh, we're, we're actually correlating what we're seeing and, and actually trying to better utilize water. And, and so here we see a progression, you know, this is where the, this is a, this is actually a field of zoysia. And we see that we actually start out with a little green on, on uh, the 10th of April. By the 1st of May, we're, we're, we're turning a whole lot more brown. By 5.13, we're back green. So, so we're actually correlating, okay, with our moisture sensors, what is the point at which we really need to, to, uh, to manage our watering? And so we're, we're dialing that in pretty well at this point. We're doing some uh, athletic field research. This is, a, this is something that, that we noticed. This is at Austin Tyndall. This is a uh, sports complex in Osceola County, just, just uh, south of the Orlando Airport. And in this, what it is is our ryegrass is over on the left. This is 419, so this is a Bermuda grass. Uh, remember I said that we use 419 on, on our athletic fields. So the one on the left has actually been overseeded with ryegrass. And the reason that we do that, we do that with Bahia grass, we do that with Bermuda grass, because people want green grass. They really don't want brown grass. And in particular, who wants green grass here is Disney World. So Disney actually rents these fields for some athletic competitions that they're using. But we have these two fields that were, were one was overseeded with ryegrass and the other was not. This is just anecdotal information. I want you to keep looking at, at how the ryegrass is doing as we're heating up in the summer. So at this point, I would say the field actually that was not overseeded is looking better than the overseeded field. And as we continue along, you will see that that actually becomes even more pronounced that our overseeded field, our, our Bermuda grass really doesn't come back with a lot of vigor. And so here we are, even in the rainy season when we're getting plenty of rain on this, on June the 14th, and our field over on the left, even though it looked better in, uh, in early uh, April, it still is not recovered by June the 14th. So, so that is something that we're looking more and more at uh, is maybe an aleopathic response that ryegrass is, is actually stunting the onset of regrowth of our Bermuda. So we're going to be working on, on some of that. And, and again, this translates not only to a homeowner type situation, but it also, we use ryegrass to graze cattle with. So, you know, we, we want that bahia grass to really green up in the spring and start growing. Well, we may unintentionally be hurt, harming our regrowth by, uh, by establishing ryegrass, you know, during the winter time. We've been doing some frost assessments as well to, to determine uh, which one of these uh, turf grasses are really going to do well with frost. Uh, one of the things I would like for you to take a look at is, is you see these, these patterns that we have associated with this frost damage. Um, again, this is something that homeowners will, will you know, it, it'll, it'll leave you scratching your head. You would not think that there are those types of microclimates where one little spot will be a, a lot colder than another, but you have, it, it, it almost looks like a, a picture of a brain, um, you know, those are going to be some of our frost damage areas. So we, we've actually done some of those and, but basically that is, uh, that is the presentation of kind of what we've been working on and, and kind of where we are with, with some of our research. Okay, well, thank you, Stacy. That was great. Um, just goes to show everybody that, you know, University of Florida and Extension is always working with researchers, with industry to find solutions for lawn problems other than just spraying more because that's, we don't really want to be, 
recommending that you spray more. I mean, we have services that are more than happy to spray more than they should sometimes, but we're always trying to find solutions. Um, it just takes time, takes patience, you know, research does take time. So like I said, some of the most common questions that we get, and especially for anybody on here today that lives in Spring Hill and has a lawn, you have a lot of problems with your lawns there, especially if you're trying to keep a nice homeowner association type St. Augustine lawn. It can be difficult. And I've talked to a lot of people. I'm sure Stacy's spoken in the past to a lot of people also in Spring Hill who've just gotten a whole string of bad advice and their lawn dies. They replace it. They have to replace it again. And it can be difficult. But you, if you guys usually, have any other questions about lawns, you know, feel free to contact our office. We're more than happy to diagnose it and figure out what to do. Actually, Bill, the, 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 the worst situations that we usually see, almost every conversation starts off with, my neighbor said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my neighbor <laughs> said. Usually they do something the neighbor says, and it's totally bad. Or... When I used to live in X, Y, or Z, we did this. Um, I'm sure you encounter people who every fall put down lime on their lawn because it, when they lived in New Hampshire, that's what they did. It's sweet. If you ask the them, pool. why do you do it? They have no idea. It's just they always did it. <laughs> yep. Yep. And you don't want to do that here. It could cause worse problems than what you have. You might be making the problem even worse. Yep. So yeah, we, we'll actually be doing a lot more research on, on some of the things that I kind of pointed out that we'll be working on as soon as, uh, you know, some of our travel restrictions are, are lifted and, and yep. those type of things. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing more. So there'll be more to come on this, but uh, I'm really, I guess the one take home message is those of you that have had a issue with take all root rot, you know, we, we replace that, that floor tam over and over and over. And then sometimes you say, well, I'm giving up on St. Augustine. And then they switch to Zoysia. Well, Zoysia gets it too. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I see Citra Blue taking the place of some of that where we have that uh, diseased uh, turf grass. You know, replacing that with Citra Blue, I think, is going to be a very viable option. Yeah, because we encounter a lot of lawns where their lawn will die. They replace, you know, floor tan lawn will die from take all root rot. They're told they have to replace it by the homeowners association. They do. And one or two or three years later, it dies again. And replacing your lawn every two years can get very expensive and a lot of work also. So, yeah, I'd be really, you know, interested to see the first lawns here in Spring Hill that are replaced with Citra Blue and see how well it works. So also one of the things on Citra Blue is it is not a whole lot more expensive than Floor Tam, even though it's a newly released variety. So this year is the first year that you're actually going to be able to purchase that. And, and some of our, you know, with, with looking around at some of our uh, sod farms, um, they, it's not a whole lot more expensive, maybe 10 cent a square foot more. So, um, so again, it's, it, it, it won't be cost prohibitive. Okay. Well, I think we only have two questions. One, somebody email, emailed me some pictures of our mango tree, but I see in the chat box here, Eric has what looks like small blood sucking flies. Are these stable flies and how do we get rid of them? He also has some kind of insect on his Mexican flame vine, mostly at the tips of each tentacle. And he thought that they were youngsters for the blood sucking fly. He tried pruning the infected pieces off, but they have just reinfected the ends. So any guesses what he could have? I think he has two different problems here. Yeah. So, so first off we, we have some biting flies. So, it depends on what the fly looks like. We, we have some flies that look like normal house flies until they bite you. Um, and, and so again, the, the, fly, the fly bite is, is actually very painful because, because of their mouth part. It is, it's probably more painful than, than say a mosquito or something like that. They, I, I don't think these things have anything in common because our, our uh, our flies are actually going, our immature fly stage is going to be a maggot. So 
our maggots are, are you know, they're, they're generally not a lot of plant feeding insects, um, you know, and, and so I, I think we're actually looking at two different problems. So we, we, have, we have horse flies, we have deer flies. Um, in some cases, actually, one of the things that we can do is, uh, you know, we can wear insect repellent, you know, find the source. A lot of times they'll kind of go away. They're going to be seasonal. Um, we can actually modify our clothing a lot to help with biting flies. So flies are going to be attracted to darker colors. So in, in the wild, their, their, their typical prey item, whether it's a deer or a bear or a, you know, squirrel, is going to be a darker colored um, uh, creature. So, so when we wear light colored clothing, that's not as attractive to them as if we're wearing, you know, darker colored clothing. And, you know, I've got a black cap that I usually wear. You know, if, if fly season's bad, I'm not wearing a black hat. Um, you know, I'm going to wear a lighter color hat and, and, and go, go through there. And, and so, you know, I, I see deer flies, they're, they're going to be very seasonal. Uh, stable flies are going to be, stable flies are going to look like the, the normal house flies. And they're going to, um, they're, they're, they're also going to be seasonal. Um, so basically, you know, it's not something that we have to kind of try to spray the world to get rid of. Um, they are quite a nuisance, but, um, but I would just say, hang on, they'll, they'll go away. Yeah, I know from going out hiking in the past in Hernando County, if Eric has a problem with the yellow deer flies, oh, they'll bite the heck out of you. They're yeah. bad. <laughs> actually, well, you know, one of the things that we've been having, in, and actually I still live in Hernando County, by the way, so, so I, can, I, I know what's happening there right now, but um, we've actually been having a, a heck of a time with thrips and, and thrips, you know, typically feed on plants. Well, we've got such a high population that when we're out by the pool, thrips are attracted to the color blue, which is what our pool is. And so when we're out by the pool, we get these plant feeding insects. They're tiny. They're extremely small and they have a rasping mouth part. It's like a chainsaw blade. And so they will rasp your skin. And, and I told my wife, I said, they're, they're, they're tasting you. So they don't know if you're, you are a plant or they don't care really what you are. They're going to taste you and see if you taste good. And in the process of tasting, when you have a very high thrips population, um, they, it, it is almost like you're dealing with no CMs. No CMs is what they call them here in Florida, but sand gnats is what we call them in Georgia. Um, you know, you can't see them, but, but it is a very similar type situation. You know, you see a lot more no see down by the coast than we do inland, but the thrips have been very, very bad this year. Yeah, I spoke to a gentleman before who said he had a problem with very tiny insects in his pool. They're plugging up the filter. He was just, I mean, they were like covering the surface of the water and he brought them in. I looked at them under the microscope and those are thrips. What the situation was, he had an oak tree that hung over his pool, mm -hmm. and the thrips will feed on the oak tree, and then when they want to pupate, they want to become adult thrips, they fall off and head towards the ground. So they will fall off and land on the screen. They're small enough, they go through the screen, end up in his pool. And it was, it's a problem for him now every, two weeks out of the year, and he knows what it is. I said, you can remove the oak tree. That would, you know, reduce your problem long term. But thrips are out there, and thrips can be a kind of unusual problem every once in a while. Um, okay, here, let me go back to my PowerPoint here, and I went ahead and put the pictures of the. Mango tree. We'll go through. Okay, um, we have a couple pictures of a mango tree here. And if this is growing in Hernando County, we're a little far north for mango trees. You can grow them here. The problem is almost every winter, we're gonna have at least a few nights where it's gonna get entirely too cold for mangoes. Because mangoes don't go dormant, they go quiescent. And if it gets below about 50 degrees, they get unhappy. And if it gets down to freezing, they can, you know, be severely damaged or killed. Um, but here are the four pictures. 
that she said, and I see what looks like some pretty healthy um, new growth on them. But other than that, um, what would you think this is? Fungal, some type of fungal leaf spot? Probably. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm leaning toward a fungal leaf spot. Um, and again, it, what looks like happened is we, we got this fungal leaf spot early on. So when, when these leaves were newer, we, we started getting this infection. So what you might, what, what the homeowner might want to do in, in the future is, you know, we, we, when we're using fungicides, it, it's not curative. So that, that's what you have to remember. If we go to the doctor with an illness, we want to be cured of that illness. But in the plant world, that's not the case. The best case scenario for you using a fungicide is to keep it from getting a whole lot worse. So again, we, we'd fire our, our physician if, if this were the case um, and find one that would cure us. But, but plants are just different. So these fungal infections, this is not going to get worse. I, I've always joked and said there is no fungicide that goes by the trade name of Lazarus. If it's dying or dead, it's not coming back to life. And so that's the one thing to keep in mind is what I would do on this tree is you can treat it with a fungicide this year, but if you really want to, to head this off going into next year is when we get that new flush of leaves, we actually want to go ahead and protect that with the fungicide um, next year. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's, it's a, looks really good for a mango tree here in Hernando County. Like I said, we are a little far north. Looks like it's getting some, you know, decent new growth. So probably spraying preventatively with a fungicide would be a good idea. Because exactly. especially as we start to get into uh, warmer days, warmer nights, more frequent rain, you know, very high humidity all day, you're going to start to see more fungal problems on a lot of different plants, including mangoes. Yeah. And, and actually, you, you're, you're exactly correct, Bill. I mean, it, it's, this is a pretty good looking mango tree for Hernando County. So, um, so again, we can't, we can't control every spot. We can't control every bug bite. Um, you know, otherwise, we'll, we'll drive ourselves crazy trying to, trying to chase these things. So, but that is a pretty good looking mango for Hernando County. Make sure you're fertilizing it appropriately. You know, you can use a, a fruit, fruiting tree fungicide, uh, I'm sorry, fruiting tree uh, fertilizer. So, you know, those are going to have a little bit of phosphorus in them. And, and so, uh, again, enjoy your mangoes. Yeah, yeah, I know it is possible to grow them here. Uh, you don't see it very often, but I've seen, um, I've had people email me pictures of the trees that get a nice crop of mangoes on them. So it is possible. Uh, we have one more question here from Carol. She said uh, she's tr she has a mini eggplant plant growing in a pot on her lanai. A purple flower has sprouted. Is there anything special I need to do next? Okay, so actually you're getting to that critical point, Carol, where this is one of the things about plants growing in pots. It is, uh, it's like keeping a, a cat in a room, you know, it, and, and, and it never gets to go anywhere except that room. So you're going to have to provide that cat with food and you're going to have to provide it with water and you have to play with them, otherwise they're going to tear up the curtains. So, so you have to do those three things and, and when we put a plant in a pot, the only input that that plant is getting is what we put into that plant. So for that reason, sometimes plants growing in a pot are a little more difficult than if we just stick it out in the dirt. Um, because you've got micronutrients that, that, that may or may not be available to that plant that we're going to have if we just stick it out in the dirt. Um, so that is what you have to be really critical of is to make sure that you're adding the right amount as well. So when, when I tell you to fertilize that plant, we don't really want to go too heavy because guess what? The roots can't get away from that fertilizer if you go too heavy. If you go too light, we're, we're, we're probably not going to, to see the, the full potential of that plant. So the one critical element that you need as far as the fertilizer goes when, when we are blooming is, is going to be phosphorus. 
So phosphorus gets a bad rap for some of the things like harmful algal blooms and things like that. But when we use phosphorus responsibly, it's very important in our food production. So phosphorus is, so our three big uh, nutrients are going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So nitrogen is going to be responsible for leaves. So if you want your grass to grow, you're going to put nitrogen because that is, that's going to be your leaf that you want. As soon as you switch over to, to producing um, fruit and flowers, you're, you're going to switch over to a higher phosphorus um, uh, fertilizer. So, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about vegetable plants, our, our standard recommendations, we're going to use some 10, 10, 10. So that, that's 10 pounds of, of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, 10 pounds of potassium. That is our kind of standard recommendation on, on a lot of vegetable plants, but that phosphorus is going to be responsible for that fruit and, 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 and flower production. So actually they commercially sell a, a product to really help your flowers, you know, which is phosphorus, but they're going to call it Bloom Buster and charge, you know, four or five times the amount that you would pay for a bag of uh, triple super phosphate. But Bloom Buster is actually going to make your flowers bloom more because that's that middle number that you really need. And the final number is potassium. That's going to be responsible for our root growth. And that is going to be, um, so, so the, the two numbers that you really need for say turf grass are going to be nitrogen and potassium. You don't really need that phosphorus because our, our, our St. Augustine grass is not growing fruit. But if I'm in a orchard or I'm growing that mango tree, I don't want to see that phosphorus because I want that, that mango tree or that eggplant to bloom and set fruit. And, and so that is, so as you go forward, Carol, the, the, the really important nutrient for you is going to be a fertilizer that has uh, phosphorus in it. But again, be very careful about the amount that you add. You don't want too much and you don't want too little. Um, again, it's going to depend on the size of your pot, whether you're dealing with a, a small pot or you've got a big pot a, as far as how much fertilizer. There, there'll be some guidelines on that, um, on that bag and it'll be in you know, pounds per thousand square feet. So you're just going to have to back it down from per thousand square feet down to you know, one square foot. Yeah, and if you fertilize very lightly, you could always add more. Yeah. But if you put down too much, you can't take it back. So, so keep that in mind. That's always kind of a, a good rule to live by when it comes to fertilizer. And, and actually, we, we have some of our plants. You know, my wife has a lot of plants that we shouldn't be growing in, in Hernando County. So, you know, we've got, we've got lots of orchids and stuff like that, and they're in pots. But, you know, we can't – the reason that we keep those in pots is because we need to bring them in in the wintertime or put them in our greenhouse. So, so that is, it, it's a lot easier if, if you can grow a vegetable plant and you've got the room to do that, it is so much easier growing it in the, in the open ground. I have both. I have vegetables growing in the ground and I have a lot in containers also. Mm -hmm. And they, they can both do well if you follow the right timing. Mm -hmm. And I have some eggplants right now. I have the little uh, miniature white ones and they're doing great. I'm starting to get eggplants off of them. So, so it looks like you, you planted it at the correct time of year for them. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any other questions here. So, um, uh, Stacy, any, any final thoughts you want to share with everybody? Actually, no, no. I, will, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on, Bill, and, and we will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be doing some more turf grass research, kind of be on the lookout for some of these things that, that we're going to do. And, um, you know, if you, you've got a wealth of knowledge there with Dr. Lester and, and the Master Gardeners in Hernando County, so please use them. Um, you know, it's, that, that's, that's the best I can tell you. And, you know, you've, don't, don't rack your brain and, and, and try to become a Google expert. You've got experts that, that, that are in the extension office in Hernando County that really know a lot. And so lean on that expertise to, to really solve our, our issues in a very scientific way, not, you know, what, what some, some neighbor says on Google.
Exactly. And we're still here. I mean, you can get a hold of us, you know, on the phone, through email, and obviously we're here every Thursday morning with our virtual plant clinic. So this is a really great way to to email me pictures in advance and get your questions answered. And that way everybody can hear the question and the answer also and everybody can learn from it. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. It looks like it's about that time. So hopefully we'll see everybody back here again next Thursday. Um, everybody be safe, watch out for the rain. At least you won't have to water your lawn this week. Uh, I think that's all gonna get taken care of uh, for most all of us. And thank you and we will see you again next week.